Um, all right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, um, we are still going to be in the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're going to be looking at Sutta number 41, uh, which is on page 379 of this edition. This is the Salayeka Sutta to the people of Sala. So I wanted to do this sutta for kind of two reasons. The first reason is because I know that we've been doing a lot of suttas in Dharma doors for a while now. And all of the suttas coming out of, you know, the Pali Canon are pretty much directed towards monastics. And indeed, of course, as you know, you know, early Buddhism was really focused on the monastic path. And so most of the suttas that are in the early collections are for renunciants, both monks and nuns. But it's, you know, they're teachings for people who have sort of taken the that full commitment, at least in the monastic sense. So I wanted to do sutta number 41 tonight because it's a sutta for lay people. <laughs> Finally, a sutta for us. So uh, this is going to be an interesting one for being a teaching to householders. So that'll be interesting for us to talk about. I actually, I have a lot to say about that. Like, I really want to focus on that tonight. Like that this is a sutta. This is a teaching for householders. So, and then the other reason why I wanted to do it is because last week's sutta, we were dealing, at least it came up, it came up a little bit about these Brahmins, that these, they, these other kind of practitioners, or that there was a way of being a Brahmacharyan, a, a practitioner of the ways of Brahma, and then you would be a Brahmin. So this sutra actually kind of involves some Brahmins, so that's sort of our connective tissue with last week. Um, but again, the main thing, though, is, is that it's a really good sutra for what, what could be called lay people in that way. Um, so, yeah, so it's not that big of a sutta. No, I guess it's not. It's a few pages. So uh, let's get into it. Um. Yeah, let's just get into it, and then I'll, I'll probably do the thing where I read a little bit, stop, we'll chat, read a little bit more, stop and chat. So if you have this edition at home and you want to follow along, I'm over on page 379. And here we go with the Salayika Sutta, to the people of Sala. So thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering by stages in the Kosalan country with a large Sangha of bhikshus. And eventually he arrived at a Kosalan Brahmin village named Sala. The Brahmin householders of Sala heard the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the Kosalan country with a large Sangha of bhikshus and has come to Sala. Now, a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect. That blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of people to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened blessed one. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the dhamma, which is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and the right phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahats. Then the Brahmin householders of Sala went to the Blessed One, paid homage, 
and sat down at one side. Some exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down to one side. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards the blessed one and sat down to one side. Some pronounced their name and clan and sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the blessed one's presence and sat down at one side. And some kept silent and sat down to one side. When they were all seated, they said to the blessed one, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why some beings here upon the dissolution of the body after death reappear in states of deprivation in an unhappy destination in perdition even in hell and what is the cause and condition why some beings here upon the dissolution of the body after death reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. Householders, the Buddha said, it is by reason of conduct, not in accordance with the Dharma, by reason of unrighteous conduct, that some beings here on the dissolution of the body after death reappear in states of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. It is by reason of conduct in accordance with the Dharma, by reason of righteous conduct, that some beings here upon the dissolution of the body after death reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. We do not understand the detailed meaning of Master Gotama's utterance, which he has spoken in brief, without expounding in detail the meaning. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach us the Dharma so that we might understand the detailed meaning of his utterances. Then, householders, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, they replied, and the Blessed One said this. Householders, there are three kinds of bodily conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. There are four kinds of verbal conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. And there are three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. And how, householders, are there three kinds of bodily conduct not in accordance with the Dharma? Unrighteous conduct? Well, here, someone kills living beings. They're murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. They take what has not been given. They take by way of theft the wealth and property of others in the village or the forest. They misconduct themselves in sensual pleasures. They have intercourse with people who are protected by others, either by mothers or fathers or mothers and fathers or brothers or sisters or relatives or who have spouses or who are protected by the law or even those who are betrothed to others. That's how there are three kinds of bodily conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. And how, householders, are there four kinds of verbal conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct? Here someone speaks falsehood. When summoned to a court or to a meeting, or to their relatives' presence, presence, or to a guild, or to the royal family's presence, and questioned as a witness thus, So, good person, tell us what you know. Or, not knowing, this person says, I know, da 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 da. Or, seeing, they say, I do not see. 
in full awareness that they're speaking falsehoods for their own ends, or for other ends, or for some trifling worldly end. Or they speak maliciously. They repeat elsewhere what has been heard here in order to divide those people from these people, or they repeat to those people what they have heard from these people in order to divide these people from those people. Thus they are one who divides those who are united. They are a creator of divisions, one who rejoices and enjoys discord, one who rejoices in discord, delights in discord, a speaker of words that creates discord. De uh, yeah. He speaks harshly. They utter words that are rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger, unconducive to concentration. They are a gossip. They speak at the wrong time, or they speak what is not fact. They speak what's useless. They speak what is contrary to the dharma and the discipline. At the wrong time, they speak such words that are worthless, unreasonable, immoderate, and unbeneficial. That's how there are four kinds of verbal conduct, not in accordance with the dharma, unrighteous conduct. And how, householders, are there three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with the Dharma? Unrighteous conduct? Here, someone is covetous. They covet the wealth and property of others, thus thinking, oh, may what belongs to another be mine. Or they have a mind of ill will and intentions of hate, thinking thus, may these beings be slain and slaughtered, May they be cut off, perish, or be annihilated. Or they have a wrong view, distorted vision, thinking thus. There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. There is no fruit or result of good or bad actions. There's no this world, there's no other world. There's no mother, no father, no beings who are born spontaneously. There's no good or virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have themselves realized by direct knowledge and declare this world and other worlds. That's how there are three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. So householders, it's by reason of such conduct not in accordance with the Dharma, by reason of such unrighteous conduct that some beings here, upon the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in states of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. All right, let's work on that, and then we'll do the next part. So this is a pretty classic sutra in one sense that these are sort of, well, these might be called the 10 virtuous actions. They could also be called 10 um, wholesome dharmas, 10 kushala dharmas. Now, you know, there's sort of like varying lists of the 10 virtues but I just want you to know, actually, I was going to say this at the beginning and I kind of forgot to. So let me say it now. So this is a particular sutra to the people of Sala. And as we're reading this sutra, I think one of the things that we should keep in mind is, and I've talked about this in many Dharma doors past, but it's about keeping in mind what would come to be called upaya skillful means. But what I mean by that is, is that, so the Buddha wandering through the Kosalan country has come to this village of Sala and all of these Brahmin 
householding men, and I do want to emphasize that it's a group of like the elders, the 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 male elders, they've all gotten together for around the Buddha. And so the Buddha, and actually let me just kind of recap the beginning of this, because I also want to mention something else. The householder Brahmins, their question is pretty straightforward. How do you go to heaven? And how do you avoid going to hell? <laughs> and the Buddha says, well, through conduct, like through proper righteous conduct, through conduct in accordance with the Dharma. And, you know, there's a way in which we study Dharma, we study sutras every Sunday night, and you probably study them other times as well. But what I'm getting at is, is that there's a way that all of us here are sort of, we're already on board with the Dharma in that way. And I don't even mean that we're already on board with Buddhism. What I mean is, is that we are all probably already on board with the idea that it's our actions that is sort of driving this, driving our future in a certain sense. And I think it's actually important if we want to read these sutras appropriately, I think it's important to remember that the Buddha is responding to a bunch of people who have different drishtis, different worldviews. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's other possibilities for why somebody might go to heaven versus go to hell. And what I mean is, is that there are other belief systems. And one belief system is that there's sort of like this divine being, uh, you know, call it God or, or whatever, and there's one idea that you actually just to have you just have to have like um you know a good strong relationship with that deity with that god being you know you have to be you know uh subservient to that god and but that god is the one that's going to take you to heaven or put you into hell and so you know that might spill over into my actions but only because you know i'm have the i have this relationship with god not a more kind of nuts and bolts scientific view of basically what we would call cause and effect where no 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 everything you're doing with the body everything you're saying with your mouth and everything you're thinking with your mind are having these results and that's what's going to cause you to have a future that's either better or worse in that sense there's also the buddha is also often responding to another belief system which is the belief system that there's no rhyme or reason to this that it's completely chaotic and what i mean is is that it, it it's completely random who gets rich and who winds up poor. It's completely random and kind of just, I guess what we would call luck. You just get lucky and you wind up in heaven or you get unlucky and you wind up in hell. By the way, on that note, I already did it, but uh, let me be a little more explicit about it. As you have often heard in Dharma doors, when we start talking about ideas of like rebirth and like, which this sutra is dealing with, it's like this idea of like the next life. I always like to remind everybody, if you're not, if you don't think about like last lifetime, next lifetime, you can really substitute all of this with 10 years ago and 10 years from now. And it's the idea of like, where am I going to be 10 years from now? And some of us might have a wish, might have a dream of being in a better situation 10 years from now, <laughs> wealthier, whatever. And we might fear winding up kind of destitute on the streets or something like that. And so just to think about it that way. 
You don't, we don't need to get so crazy as to go all the way to the next lifetime. Everything we're talking about applies to 10 years from now, five years from now, a year from now, a month, a week, a moment from now. So just want to say that. All right. So the Brahmins have come and said, how do we get a better future? How do, is it just luck? Is it God? Like what's up? And the Buddha says, no, it's in your conduct. And that's when the Brahmins say, okay, could you say a little more about this conduct? And the Buddha says, sure. There's three aspects of bodily conduct, four aspects of verbal conduct, and three aspects of mental conduct. And of course, by the way, what we are talking about when we talk about conduct, we are talking about karma. Talking about karmic action, and let's remember the word karma just means action. That's all it means. Action of the body. Action of the mouth activity or action of the mind and the buddha basically identifies these three actions of the body that are unrighteous that lead to this kind of lower rebirth situation kill killing stealing and basically what we would call sexual misconduct so one of the things i want to do I want to kind of mention this, and I'm not going to go into deep detail about this, but I do want to mention it. So I'm the type of Dharma teacher that, you know, I vacillate in that sense between teaching a kind of more straightforward Hinayana Dharma, five skandhas, you know, the basics of Buddhism. But then I'll also get into the more Mahayana stuff, and I enjoy teaching the Vajrayana stuff too. So kind of all over the place in that way. And what I like to kind of do when I'm teaching in that way is I like to stress that because we're talking about these kind of precepts, like the um, the thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, like aspects of Buddhism. And I, I always like to make it clear that as I understand it, Buddhism kind of began as a, I, I guess what you would call a, a tradition of discipline. And they even call it, it, it even got referenced in the sutra about the discipline, the vinaya, this idea of controlling oneself. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's one approach to precepts, these ideas of like killing, stealing and such, and there's one way of looking at this and, and even observing this, by which I mean following these things. And one way to do it is sort of out of obedience. Like, because the Buddha said, like, why, why shouldn't I kill, steal, or lie, or any of these other things? Well, because the Buddha said I shouldn't. And the Buddha is the Buddha. So I will be good and kind of follow the rules. That's kind of one approach to precepts and morality in Buddhism is to follow the rules because they're kind of there for your, uh, for your benefit in that sense. But I often point out that Buddhism as a tradition sort of grew and changed and morphed and it transitions out of being a kind of tradition of discipline. And when you get into the Mahayana tradition, I kind of consider that a, a wisdom tradition. And what that means is, is that there's still the precepts, they're still observing the precepts, but there's a way in which uh, I guess what would be called the Bodhisattva and the Bodhisattva path. In the Bodhisattva path, there's this really kind of deeper approach to the precepts where, for example, let's just take the idea of being violent and killing. All right. 
So one approach to that is that Buddha told me not to, so I won't. There's another approach to that, which is also kind of in the like old school Buddhist tradition. And what that is, is, is that I'm trying to get enlightened or I'm trying to um, end my suffering. And the Buddha has told me that if I follow these precepts, it will get me to a state of enlightenment or it'll end my suffering. And I want that. I want to end my suffering. I want to be enlightened. So I'm going to avoid doing these things. And again, that approach would be the approach of discipline. Now there's this other approach though, which examines the very, like the that violent drive. And what it is, is, is that I know that there's one way of looking at um, like hostility and violence in a way even. And there's one way of looking at it. It's a deluded way, by the way. I don't want anybody to get misunderstood. Like, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. But there's a deluded way of looking at violence and hostility that as if it's strong, as if that is a sign of strength to be able to dominate, to be able to subdue, to be even the idea of like anger as a kind of a form of, of strength. And again, I think this is delusional and let me explain why. From a bodhisattva point of view, from an enlightened, wise point of view, if you really look at it, to be violent is actually to be out of control. And what I'm getting at is, is that to actually be not violent is very difficult. And what I'm getting at is, is that it is, it is very strong to be nonviolent. And what I'm getting at is, is if you start looking at it, what you realize, what you realize from a Buddhist point of view is that violent, like violent, hostile, angry behavior is utterly conditioned, habitual. And it's this kind of like, it's just this reaction. Whereas to actually be calm, cool, peaceful, and not, and I'm talking about, by the way, let me be clear. I'm not talking about restraining oneself from being violent. I'm talking about not being violent, like not being hostile. And what you realize as soon as you actually try to be totally not hostile and not angry and not violent, you realize how difficult it is to actually do that. You realize how when you get angry, you're, you are, again, you're out of control. You're not in control. You're, it's just like, um, again, you're just allowing conditioned habitual behavior to, to go. And when you start looking at it that way, you realize that the real strength is in peacefulness. But there's a way, again, that society or what have you is a little confused about what is strong and what is weak. Because I know that conventionally, a peaceful monk or whatever might be seen as weak. And, a, and, a MA, and an MMA fighter is seen as strong. But uh, the Bodhisattva, again, reflects at a deeper level and realizes what real strength is and what real weakness is. And then at that point, avoiding killing or avoiding violence is not, it's no longer done out of obedience and out of discipline. It's done because you realize that's the wise, smart thing to do. And you just, you, 
you don't see the, any reason to be violent or hostile anymore. So it's just two different approaches to the same practice If in that sense. Yes, be a good Buddhist and don't be violent, but you could also reflect on it deeper in that way. The same goes for stealing, the second aspect of bodily conduct. In There's a certain way, especially like in a capitalist society where whoever has the most wins and how you got it isn't exactly like we don't necessarily care how you got it in a capitalist society. But if you if you got it, then that's what matters. So th there's a way that that's a diluted view, which says, you know, if I have to break a few rules and what I mean is that if I have to like circumvent something and steal something in order to get to the top, there might be a mentality that says, that's pretty clever. Like if I could figure out a way to steal a bunch of money from people or, you know, whatever, just, you know, whatever, commit a form of fraud, it's like, ha ha, I'm smart. And it's like, yeah, if you want to keep being attached to material things or whatever. But again, that's what I'm getting at is that there's a way to be disciplined and respectful of others' property, let's say, and then, oh, I won't steal because I wouldn't want people to steal from me. But there's another way of looking deep at the desire to take what has not been given. And if you look deeper at that, you kind of begin to realize like, yeah, what am I trying to do here? Get stuff? Accumulate stuff? And that's when, for again, for the bodhisattva, what shifts is the realization that, oh, if I'm actually generous, and and the and the and the karmic motion goes this way rather than this way the bodhisattva realizes that that's smarter being generous versus taking cuz you're actually digging yourself into a deeper hole by this action of stealing and that who wants to go deeper in a deep hole so again there's a wisdom approach to these things and then the third aspect of the body I also, I wanted to do this sutra to address like sexuality among householders. This sutra is pretty straightforward. It basically says like, what is bad, unrighteous bodily behavior regarding sexuality? Basically hooking up with somebody that's already in some situation. <laughs> that's what I read is that if somebody's in some other situation that they're either somebody's daughter or somebody's son, meaning they're underage. And so they they belong to that, those people in that sense, or they're betrothed to somebody else, or they're already married. So if they're taken in any other way, don't hook up with them. I think if the message that the Buddha was trying to convey is like, don't hook up with anybody, then he wouldn't have gone to such detail of saying like, avoid these people, avoid these people, avoid these people, and avoid these people. No, he says, avoid all these type of people because it's to let you know who is available in that sense. So those are the three aspects of the body, bodily conduct. Any ideas or thoughts, questions, comments about those three? No. Just, it's always striking to me that <clears throat> in the list of paramitas, I don't know why it's in that order, but generosity is first. Mm. Giving, talking about giving as contrasted with taking, with stealing. And uh, I, I, just, I just think it's really interesting that generosity is that from which all the other paramitas flow. To me, it is. I'm not sure that's why it's there first. Just emphasizing your point about that there's a wisdom uh, approach to this of not stealing and, and the opposite giving. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Noam. And um, it's interesting to note that, you know, the, the paramitas that, that Noam evokes, you know, those are the 
kind of the backbone of the bodhisattva practice, beginning with giving, then moral discipline, what we're talking about tonight, then patience, then virya, energy, then meditation, and then the wisdom. So the, this kind of order. And what's interesting about it, as Noam points out, is that giving is first. Then we work on discipline. I would su suggest that in the Hinayana tradition, it's discipline first. And then there's a way that, you know, then you can kind of maybe be generous. But the focus is sort of on that discipline aspect. And it really makes the traditions have a different vibe or a different quality to them when we're leading with generosity. So it's kind of immediately socially engaged in that way. So right. great comment, Noam. Robin. Okay. I think it's interesting that the Buddha created a situation where he made it possible for others to give, you know, by begging. And um, and so creating opportunities for other people to give, I think, is a is a beautiful thing that's initiated by that that he set up. Couldn't agree more. And there, when when Buddhism, when this beautiful tradition eventually goes to East Asia to China, the Chinese actually make a very big deal about what they call the the circuit of giving. And it's actually exactly what Robin was just talking about, is this kind of um, this beautiful system that the Buddhists created, that the Buddha created in that way, where you've got these beggars, which creates an opportunity for giving. And then that creates this like circuit that is completed. And the Chinese were really into it as a like as a form of social cohesion and order. So great comment, Robin. All right, shall we proceed? So um, just really quickly to a quick review. The next part of this was the four aspects of speech of what would be called vocal karma or speech karma in that way. And these were the this idea of not lying, not speaking harshly or maliciously, or I should say speaking maliciously, speaking harshly, and then speaking idly. And in particular, the Buddha is very interested in, so when he talks about lying, he uses these this example of basically being called to court and basically saying like, yeah, I saw so-and-so do it when you didn't actually see so-and-so do it in that way. So you're just lying under oath or lying in that way. And then when he speaks of being malicious, it's about this idea of like repeating what you heard over here, over here, and then what you heard over here, over there. And with the idea of creating division. And that's sort of this malicious speech in that way where your intentions in speaking, your intention is to divide, create discord. Then they're speaking harshly, which is like being harsh with your speech towards somebody. And then a very interesting one that I've actually been kind of working on a lot lately, I would say, and it's the last one about idle speech or gossiping. And I've been spending a lot more time um, thinking before I speak in that way and really asking myself, like, why do I feel compelled to mention this? Like, am I actually just a... a a fleshy appendage to the 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 app and and I'm just like spreading memes unintentionally on behalf of the internet so I kind of stop and ask myself like am I really about to say this just because I saw it and therefore it's just kind of idle it's gossipy in a way or like am I about to to repeat this for you know an engaging idea to stimulate conversation but I don't know, I've just been spending a lot more time watching what I'm saying in that way, especially on this note of just kind of repeating things in that sense. So 
any thoughts about vocal karma? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, no, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm feeling commenty today. Just, yeah, uh, great. I mean, another piece of the not saying idle things, I, I or maybe I don't, I'm not sure what. Yeah, but a piece of it that I think about is just simplifying, like doing less, like you know, we 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 sort of in this world we fill our lives up with doing um and so much of uh the path you know even meditating is making space and 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 do, practicing not doing <laughs> for a little while so that's kind of how i relate to them yeah. you know i i think that's very wise um and i say that because if if you know when you study dharma you start to become really kind of um, sensitive to conditioning, I would say, sensitive to habit forming. And, you know, language is very much kind of one of those habits in that way. And I think you're, what you said, Noam, is really wise in that way of like meditation is first taking a break from discourse and then giving, you know, and I mentioned this last week. You know, it's this idea that there's a relationship between the mind and speech and the body, that they're in this kind of relationship where, where what you think about is what you're talking about and what you talk about is what you are doing and what you're doing is what you talk about and what you talk about is what you think about. And it just kind of keeps a conditioning going. And when you kind of start to become aware of that, I don't know, for me, there is all of a sudden a desire to stop. <laughs> Stop moving so much. Stop talking so much. Stop thinking so much. So, great comment, Noam. Maria? Um, I just wanted to add that you have me thinking about idle speech lately too and I have been accused many times in my life of talking too much and so I've been playing with this a little bit um, and what I'm noticing is that every single time I don't you know I choose not I'm re being very much more thoughtful about it but every time I choose not to say something I'm glad about it <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy that I chose to refrain so I think that's a valuable lesson. Excellent comment. Yeah, it's very rare that I don't say something and later on I'm like, ah, I should have really said that meme or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. Um, and then just a quick comment on the last three. So the last three were the three aspects of mental karma. And these were, the first one was about covetousness. Now, it's important to remember that these three are about the mind. Taking what has not been given, so this is atadana, taking what has not been given, otherwise stealing, that's the action of the body. Like that's actually taking it. Of the mind... The first of these that the Buddha talks about is actually having a covetous mind that wants to take it. The idea of seeing what somebody else has and wanting to take it, being covetous of it. And of course, you don't have to kind of be a, a rocket scientist to recognize the relationship between having a covetous mind state and then the performing of the act of stealing. <laughs> They're very directly related in that sense. And so this is pr the practice here is subtle because this is your own mind. This is your own heart. And only you know what is in your own mind and heart in terms of your desirousness and covetousness. Somebody else can call you out on stealing because that's your that's outward. But if your covetousness, only you know about it. And so the work is to pay attention to one's own mind and notice when one is desirous of other people's property in that way. 
The same goes for ill will. Gipata, this, this second one of ill will. This is not being violent. This is the mind state of ill will that would then lead to being violent. So in other words, this is the practice of noticing when your own mind has hostile, angry thoughts towards others in that way. And again, who's to say? Only you know in that way. And so it becomes truly a practice of noticing when things have made you angry, noticing when things have basically stimulated you. And you're like, I would really like, I would really like that. Even, by the way, from a Buddhist point of view, even if you wouldn't dream of stealing it, that's actually not what this one's about. This one's about that desire to own it. Your your better half, like your your you know your your ego or your your super ego, I guess it would be. Your super ego would be like, yeah, but you shouldn't take it. But we're looking at the id. Uh, if we're getting Freudian about it, we're looking at the id that wants to steal it, and then looking at it and being like, why? Where did that come from? Where did this? ill will come from why why this ill will and then the third the last of these is about wrong view but i want to talk about it really quickly because so the the buddha gives for his example of wrong view or the person has a wrong view distorted vision which looks like this there is nothing given nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. That's the first kind of few. And right there, the Buddha seems to be talking about a kind of nihilistic view that is talking about that there's kind of no function or value or anything to making offerings in that way whether they be kind of like generous offerings in that sense or sacrificial offerings in a kind of religious sense. So this kind of nihilistic view that nothing matters, there's nothing, nothing's going on. If, if you offer something like you, if you take a, you know, if, if you've ever been to like a, uh more Asian, either Southeast Asian or East Asian temples and monasteries. And you'll notice that on altars, they, they often put, you know, not just food, but they'll often even put like, uh, uh, you know, not in, obviously not in Buddhist monasteries, but in other types of monasteries, you might even see like uh, alcohol being put up on the altar. And it's always this kind of question that some people ask, which is like, why are they like wasting perfectly good alcohol, putting it on the altar? Like ghosts and spirits don't need spirits, right? They don't need alcohol. Like, so the nihilist would see no, nothing going on there, but wasting your time. That's a wrong view from the Buddhist point of view here, but it, he's saying that, that would be a distorted vision that, that there's nothing actually given there's nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. There's no fruit or result of good or bad actions. So the nihilistic view of do, do whatever you want doesn't matter one way or the other. Um, there's no this world. There's no next world. So again, do whatever doesn't matter one way or the other. Um, there's no mother, no father. So you don't have to have basically filial piety in that sense at all. Um, there's no beings who are reborn spontaneously or otherwise. So there basically is no rebirth going on. So don't worry about it. There's no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have themselves realized by direct knowledge and declare this in the world. So basically it's also a wrong view to think that Practicing the dharmas is, is futile. Like there's no, nothing's going to come of this. Just have a good time or don't, it doesn't matter. That's all kind of wrapped up in this wrong view. So, all right. Any questions about 
those 10 non-virtuous behaviors. Cool. So, householders, the Buddha tells us on page 382 that there are three kinds of bodily conduct that are in accordance with the Dharma. Righteous conduct. There's four kinds of verbal conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And there's three kinds of mental conduct that's in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And how, householders, are there three kinds of bodily conduct in accordance with the Dharma that's righteous conduct? Well, here, someone abandoning the killing of living beings. They abstain from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, they abide compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning taking what has not been given. They abstain from taking what has not been given. They do not take by way of theft the wealth and property of others in the village or in the forest. Abandoning misconduct in sensual pleasures, they abstain from misconduct in sensual pleasures. They do not have intercourse with people who are protected by their parents or by their relatives, or who have a spouse, or who are protected by the law, or with those who are betrothed to others. That's how there are three kinds of bodily conduct that's in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And how, householders, are there four kinds of verbal conduct in accordance with the Dharma that's righteous conduct? Here, someone abandoning false speech abstains from false speech. When summoned to a court or to a meeting or to their relative's presence or to a guild or to the royal family's presence and questioned as a witness thus, so good person, tell what you know. And not knowing, he says, I don't know. Or knowing, they say, I do know. Not seeing, they say, I don't see. Or seeing, they say, yes, I see. They do it. They do not in full awareness speak falsehood for their own ends or for the ends of others or for some trifling worldly end. Abandoning malicious speech. They abstain from malicious speech. They do not repeat elsewhere what they have heard here in order to divide these people from those, nor do they repeat to these people what they have heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those people. Thus they are one who reunites those who are divided. They are a promoter of friendships. They are those who enjoy concord. They rejoice in concord. They delight in concord. A, they are a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech. They abstain from harsh speech. They speak words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip. They abstain from gossip. They speak at the right time. Speak what is fact. Speak what is good. They speak on the Dharma and the discipline. At the right time, they speak such words that are worthwhile or worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. That's how there are four kinds of verbal conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And how, householders, are there three kinds of mental conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct? Here, someone is not covetous. They do not covet the wealth and property of others, thus thinking, oh, may what belongs to another be mine. Their mind is without ill will, and they have intentions free from hate, thinking, may these beings be free from enmity, be free from affliction and free from anxiety. May they live happily. They have right view, undistorted vision, thus. They think, there is what is given, and there is what is offered. There is what is sacrificed. 
There is fruit and the results of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have themselves realized by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. That's how there are three kinds of mental conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And so, householders, it is by reason of such conduct in accordance with the Dharma, by reason of such righteous conduct that some beings here on the dissolution of the body after death reappear, reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. All right. So, the opposites, of course, of those 10, but also with, you know, examples of what it means to do that in that sense. Everybody doing okay with that? No big surprises there. Great. So now we can kind of talk about the second half of the of this sutta. So the first half is the message to the householders about the conduct. But this is actually like, why I decided to do this sutta is in the second part, actually. So the second part, which begins at paragraph 15, page 383, the Buddha tells him, so if householders, one who observes conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct, if they should wish Oh, that upon the dissolution of the body after death, I might appear in the company of well-to-do nobles. It is possible that on the dissolution of the body after death, they will reappear in the company of well-to-do nobles. And why is that? Because they observe conduct that is in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. There's much more to this, but let's just work on this first one. So this section that we're about to do, and this is kind of what closes out the sutra, this section is on something called Akankyaya. A long A, K, short A, N, K, H, short E, Y, Y, short A. Now, this idea that we're about to talk about, there's actually a whole sutta about it in the Majjhima Nikaya that we didn't do, and it's sutta number six. So let me. So sutta number six here is called this Akankya Sutta, and I didn't do this sutta actually because it's one of those suttas that's very directed towards monastics. Like it's kind of hyper directed towards being a monastic. And so because most of us, if not all of us here are householders in that way, I, I kind of skipped it. Now I'm kind of wishing I didn't skip it because of the topic and it has to do. And so I won't get into what goes on in, in number six here, but this idea of Akankia, yeah, <laughs> cannot pronounce it. But it's a very interesting idea. And, you know, it's being translated as, as wishing. And there is a sense in which it is about a wish in that way. But what we need to understand, this is just an aspect of Western culture or just, you know, an aspect of, of modern culture that we just don't quite have exactly. So what we need to understand is that at the time of the Buddha in India, there was a very well-established understanding of what is called punya or merit. And in particular, the idea that we just don't quite have in the West, the idea is, is that if, if you do something virtuous, if you do something good, you do something kind, there's an idea within the world of kind of Indian karma, there's an idea that you, by virtue of having performed that act, you get 
merit. You get punya. And the idea is, is that if I did two nice things, I would get like two merit points. And then if the next day I did another nice thing, I got three merit points now. Now, I don't want to make it sound quite so much like a video game in that sense. But what you kind of need to know is that in India at the time of the Buddha, there was this idea. And by the way, this is a, this seems to have been a, just a generally accepted idea that just was one of those things that it was just like, it's the way it works. It's just the, what's going on. Not unlike the idea of reincarnation, which at the time of the Buddha, that was just, that was understood to be the way that it works. And I mean, like, in the exact same way that you believe that it's summer, spring, winter, fall, summer, spring, winter, fall, and that you believe, like, do you believe that winter is going to happen again? Or do you just sort of, do you know winter's going to happen again? It It's sort of just so like, that's just what happens. Like, that's how it works. That, that's how the seasons work. Well, in India, definitely at the time of the Buddha and still kind of to this day, life follows, life follows, life follows, life. Just the same way, winter, spring, summer, fall. It's just the way it is working. Within that understanding of rebirth, there is also this default understanding that you can accumulate merit. And then there is this idea, this akankihaya, which is the idea that you can use that merit that you've accumulated during your life and you can direct it towards a better rebirth. And in other words, like there's ideas that you could, well, affect your future rebirth by your accumulation of punya, by your accumulation of merit. And so that is exactly what the Buddha is talking about here. And what he's saying is, is that if householders, one observes this conduct that we just talked about, the 10 virtuous actions we've just talked about, then it's possible upon the dissolution of the body after death, that they can direct that merit towards reappearing among well-to-do nobles. Now, again, I want to remind you, if you don't believe in reincarnation and rebirth, then we are talking about 10 years from now, hobnobbing with the elite or whatever on a private yacht. <laughs> Or what, you know, again, whatever your kind of idea of that might be. So, and the idea is, is that if you pulled up enough punya, enough merit, you could direct it towards fulfilling that dream. And in 10 years from now, have that in that way. Any questions about that before I kind of get deeper into that? Yeah, I know. Um, how is the use of merit different than karma like it, it seems a merit almost seems like karma that you bank or something like instead of just your action has a has a as a result you you have an action then you get some merit and then you trade it in for a result mm -hmm. is, is that true? it's i mean it's not at least the way that it's spoken about and sort of practice it's not that far from that and and there is an intimate relationship with karma the way that i would suggest thinking about it though like to to reconcile that the way that you could think about it is um i kind of use this example a lot so take um going to the gym like exercising like whether whether you go to a gym or not exercising now the exercise that you're doing every day is the karma 
That's very much like what you're doing, right? But the idea here is, is that, and I'm just trying to make an, an analogy here, so bear with me, but the karma that I put into it then basically forms a body. And that body might be healthier. It's in a healthier state because of the exercise, because of the karmic exercise. So that healthy state is kind of like merit in that when I encounter uh, like an illness, but my immune system is really strong and my body is really strong, I have the merit to counteract the illness and not get sick. Whereas if somebody had not been taking care of themselves, their body wouldn't be as in a healthy position. They wouldn't have as much merit. And therefore, when the illness came, they wouldn't have the necessary health reserves to combat it. So notice that the karma is the actions you're doing to get into that state, but then you're in that state. And so the merit is kind of like the muscles or kind of like the, the health in that way. Like you have it, mm, okay, but you have it also like at the ready. <laughs> Okay. To be implemented. That's how I think of it. So thank you for that. Yeah. Think about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, actually, no, let's not by the way. Oh, please, Noe. That's what it was. By the way, Noe has a question. Oh, thank you, Michael. I, so is, yeah, I'm a little stickler here. I don't know. Um, I might reappear, uh, you know, in the company of nobles, I sure. might reappear. And yet, yet, you know, this idea that for well, later on uh, in, in, you know, in the Hinayana is the, there is no, I, there's no, I know we will not reappear. I know he didn't exist before. That's what the Buddha has been telling me for a long time. And yet here I'm saying, so what I'm confused. He he's, he's, he's well, because he's talking to Brahmins. There it is. Never mind. I knew <laughs> I knew it. I knew <laughs> indeed. No, it, it, it's very important to recognize that this is a teaching for householders and lay people. And they think they're going to be here 10 years from now. Meaning they think they're going to be here in the next life. So the Buddha is giving them a teaching for that that next life or for 10 years from now. And let's remember, Noe, that regardless of the teaching of no self if you are identified and attached to self then you are going to be here 10 years from now so exactly but let's keep going though because there's a kind of a surprise ending to this <laughs> so we begin with this possibility of of getting reborn in the company of well-to-do nobles, right? But then he goes on to say, if householders, one who observes conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct, if they should wish, oh, that upon the dissolution of the body after death, I might reappear in the company of well-to-do Brahmins, they could do that. Or they might think in the company of well-to-do householders, it is possible that on the dissolution of the body after death, they will reappear in the company of well-to-do householders. And why is that? Because they observe conduct that is in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And now we get into this long section, and I'm going to go through it just really quickly, but we're basically about to quickly go through the entire Buddhist cosmology. So he says... If householders, one who observes conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct, if they should wish, oh, that upon the dissolution of the body after death, I might reappear in the company of the gods of the heaven of the four great kings, or in the company of the gods of the 33 levels of heaven, or in the company of the Yama gods, or in the company of the Toshita heavenly gods, or the gods of the Nirmanarati heaven, the, those who delight in creating, 
or the gods who wield power over, over others' creations, the Vasya Vartan heaven, or the gods of Brahma's retinue, even higher than that, or the gods of radiance, the gods of limited radiance, the gods of immeasurable radiance, the gods of streaming radiance, or born among the gods of glory, the gods of limited glory, the gods of immeasurable glory, the gods of refulgent glory, or among the gods of great fruit, the aviha gods, the atapa gods, the sudarshana gods, the sudasi gods, the akanita, heavenly gods, or to be reborn among the gods of the base of infinite space, the gods of the base of infinite consciousness, the gods of the base of infinite nothingness, or the gods of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. If they wished any of those, it's possible that on the dissolution of the body after death, they will reappear in the company of the gods of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And why is that? Because they observe conducts, conducts in accord with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And if householders, one who observes conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct, if they should wish, oh, that by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I might here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints, it's possible that by realizing for oneself with direct knowledge, one will here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. And why is that? Because one observes conduct in accordance with the Dharma, righteous conduct. And when this was said, the Brahmin householders of Sala said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what had been hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the darkness for those with eyesight to see forms. We go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dharma and the Sangha of Bhikshus. From today, let Master Gotama accept us as lay followers who have gone to him for refuge for life. All right. So, Noe, surprise. <laughs> So this is sort of the uh, the Buddha or the Buddhist twist on the idea that I was just telling you. And what I mean is, is that there was this already accepted idea in India that you could take your little booty of, of merit and you could use it to direct it towards a better rebirth. And the Buddha basically was like, yeah, you could do that. In fact, you could be reborn among the gods. You could be reborn among the highest gods if you want. You could be actually reborn in the highest heaven, the Akanishta heaven. Or you could actually even direct it towards being reborn in these deep jhana meditative samadhis. Infinite, con or infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. But then the surprise ending. Or you could not go for rebirth at all and direct it towards direct realization of knowledge here and now and end the taints. If you ask me, this is a very important sutra because it says that householders observing just the 10 virtuous actions that we went over, that is you could direct that cultivation towards the destruction of the taints. 
That's our hot ship. That's enlightenment. That's really important that there's a sutra that mentions that, yeah, if you do these 10 things, and I want you to notice that these 10 things do not include a lot, some of the other things that we might be familiar with in terms of the virtuous actions in that way. So I think that this is kind of upayakly, this is an important sutra to study in that way. So questions, comments, ideas about any of that last part? Maria? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's kind of like sort of in a lot of ways just practical advice for how to live um, and sort of be happy and kind of keep going in that wholesome direction. Um, I was thinking about, you know, ill will and it's kind of the same as idle speech except where I rarely, um, I mean, I would say never <laughs> regret not having ill will or suppressing <laughs> that um, feeling of ill will that might try to come up, even when it's someone who, uh, you know, did me, did caused harm to me because that doesn't, that only adds, you know, onto it because having ill will is such a painful thing. I mean, idle speech, maybe but ill will definitely is painful to hold ourselves um and certainly doesn't um isn't conducive to promoting good karma and positive merit um so um yeah just um thinking about how i i refer to um the paramis a lot just um as sort of a, a user's manual for life um and um generosity just more and it's always reinforced that that's the first one um it seems like you really have to have your own house in order to be able to give well and especially to give without thought of gain like to sort of let go of that and trust and have that faith and all that in place so Anyways, thank you. Oh, thank you. Any other questions, ideas? Robin, yeah. Uh, the ter when they use the term wishing, um, um, and, and you sort did you relate that to merit so that you could, if you gather merit, then you can wish it or maybe, you know, Wishing is a term that is complicated, I think, but I wonder hear what you have to say about that. It It is co uh, complicated. I'm glad you asked, Robin. So, I mean, basically, in terms of the language, we are talking about a kind of wish in, in the way that we would use that language in English, like in terms of hoping something happens in that sense. I do want to mention this though, Robin. So the idea of this wish that's here, and it's the wish to be, you know, reborn among well-to-do nobles, or the wish to be born among gods, or even the wish to be reborn in these deep meditative states, or even ultimately this wish to direct the merit towards my enlightenment my liberation, my enlightenment, the destruction of the taints, right? What I want you would to, what I would like you to know, Robin, is that one, there are many things that make Mahayana Buddhism different than the earlier teachings. And one major thing that makes the two very different is that in the Hinayana, in the early path, in sutras like this, there is what is called, and I'm not, this akankiheya, this wishing. And this wishing is 
again, it's sort of about my rebirth or me going to the gods, me going to meditative state, or even me ending the taints and being liberated. In the Mahayana tradition, there is actually an entire practice that is a response to this. And what that practice is called is you would know it as the transference of merit. It's what the, the language that they use in the Vajrayana tradition and the language that they use. The, the technical word is parinirmana. Parinirmana, the transference of merit, is a fascinating practice. It's part of the Bodhisattva path. And what transferring merit is, it's this idea that if you do virtuous things, you get merit. And it's the idea that you could you can use that merit. But the bodhisattva takes their merit and transfers it to the benefit of all beings, to the awakening of all beings, me included. Like, don't get it twisted. Like, it's, I'm, I'm going for enlightenment too in that way. But the transference of merit is actually this really interesting Mahayana practice that recognizes that this thing that we are talking about tonight is, although it is virtuous, it's still oddly self-oriented. And this transference of merit, where you take your merit and give it to everybody else, that's the Bodhisattva practice. Now, what I always like to share with everybody that's so cool about the Bodhisattva practice, so you, you practice moral virtue, like you practice the precepts, right? So you're building up your punya, you're building up your merit. But then you parinirmana, you transfer your merit to everybody else. Do you know how much merit you get for doing that? So now you've got like double merit that you can now transfer to all sentient beings. And now talk about a circuit of giving because you're actually increasing your amount of merit by doing this. And it, then it becomes like um, the only image that comes to mind is priming a pump. If you have ever primed a pump, if you've ever done the thing as a kid where you suck in a hose and get the water going, but then eventually the water just starts going all by itself, that's parinirmana. If you get the transference of merit going, eventually it becomes an un, an inexhaustible, unending flow of merit. It's one of the most beautiful aspects of the Bodhisattva path. And again, it's not to disparage this. It's just to put that Bodhisattva level on, it's just a whole other level. So, so thanks for asking, Robin, because I did want to share that. Wasn't sure if I was going to, be able to mention that. Cool. So one last comment, unless anybody has any responses to that. Really quickly. So this little section that I went through quickly, where I went, we went from the realm of the four great heavenly kings, all the way up to the Akanishta heaven. Well, if you're interested in any of that, um, this is just, I'm going to let everybody know that next Saturday, uh, I'm going to be doing a little visual presentation on Buddhist cosmology. It's a talk I used to give at SFDC. It was sort of like just the, you know, the introduction to basic Buddhist cosmology. But basically, this is sort of a, a quick version of it as far as a lot of the heavenly realms. Uh, but if that kind of thing is of interest to you or you'd like to learn more about it, um, I'm going to be giving this visual talk online um, this next Saturday, May 18th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, it's by donation. There's a suggested donation, but it's information that I would like to share with everybody. Uh, so if that's something of interest, you could go to my website and find out more and register. Um, but I just wanted to mention that and it kind of thank you. And uh, just wanted to mention that because it kind of fits into that little part of tonight's reading. So otherwise, I think that'll be it for me, unless there's any comments about that or questions about anything we talked about tonight. 